on World News Tonight. Climate catastrophe. Death toll rises in catalytic Pakistan floods. This comes as the UN appeals for aid. Inspectors arrive. Amid growing international fears, IAEA team meets President Zelensky before the planned inspection. End of an era. Last Soviet leader who brought the Cold War to a peaceful end dies at age 91. And cooling down. North Koreans enjoy summer at a water park in Pyongyang. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And our top story today is still in Pakistan as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned that the world is sleepwalking into environmental destruction as he launched a $160 million appeal for flood ravaged Pakistan. More than 1,100 people have been killed and 33 million others impacted in one of the country's worst monsoon seasons in over a decade. A third of Pakistan is literally underwater after weeks of torrential rain. More than 1,100 people have died in the heavy flooding, including 380 children. Roads and bridges have been washed away, making it harder to get aid to the more than 33 million people affected by the disaster. Hundreds of thousands of them are living outdoors without access to food, clean water, shelter or basic health care. Prime Minister Shabash Sharif has made a desperate plea for international help as the United Nations launched an emergency appeal on Tuesday for $160 million. The Secretary General plans to visit the country next week. Pakistan is a washing suffering. The Pakistani people are facing a monsoon on steroids, the relentless impact of epochal levels of rain and flooding. The climate catastrophe has killed more than 1,000 people with many more injured. Millions are homeless. Schools and health facilities have been destroyed. Livelihoods are shattered. Critical infrastructure wiped out and people's hopes and dreams have washed away. Pakistan's Prime Minister responded by saying the appeal needed to be multiplied rapidly and pledged transparency for every penny. Early estimates put the damage from the floods at more than $10 billion, the government said adding that the world had an obligation to help Pakistan cope with the effects of man-made climate change. The country has received nearly 190% more rain than the 30-year average in the quarter through August this year. There are fears the devastation will further derail an economy already in turmoil, possibly leading to an acute food shortage and adding to skyrocketing inflation. More than 2 million acres of agricultural land has been flooded. U.S. President Joe Biden condemned violent threats against FBI agents who searched predecessor Donald Trump's home as sickening as he called for more police funding as an assault weapons ban. And now it's sickening to see the new attacks on the FBI. In a fervent speech against gun violence on Tuesday, U.S. President Joe Biden condemned as sickening the violent threats against FBI agents who searched Donald Trump's Florida home. Threatening the life of law enforcement agents and their families for simply carrying out the law and doing their job. I want to say this as clear as I can. There's no place in this country, no place, for endangering the lives of law enforcement. No place. None, never, period. I'm opposed to defunding the police. I'm also opposed to defunding the FBI. Biden's speech, delivered in Pennsylvania, comes after the FBI and U.S. Department of Homeland Security warned earlier this month of an increase in threats following the search of Trump's residence at Mar-a-Lago, when agents removed what prosecutors described as 11 sets of classified documents, including some marked top secret as part of a criminal investigation. In recent weeks, Biden has largely sidestepped conversations about the investigation, with the White House saying the Justice Department operates independently, even though the risk of disclosing sensitive information has national security implications. Biden, during his speech, also spoke passionately about passing an assault weapons ban and the importance of police funding in the important battleground state ahead of November midterm elections. 
I'm determined to ban assault weapons in this country. Determined. We're living in a country awash with weapons of war. For God's sake, what's the rationale for these weapons outside of a war zone? In addition to the ban, the president has called for Congress to provide $37 billion for crime prevention programs, with a portion dedicated to hiring and training an additional 100,000 police officers over the next five years. Tuesday's visit to the small city of Wilkesbury gives Biden an opportunity to address a key concern for voters in a critical state that helped him win the presidency in 2020. Trump, who is flirting with challenging Biden for a second term in 2024, is expected to hold a rally in the same city on Saturday. Pennsylvania also plays host to one of the closest watched Senate races in the upcoming midterm election. Still in the U.S., tragic irony unfolds in Mississippi, where just days ago, record rains inundated the Jackson area. The city is finding itself in desperate need to find usable water after failure in the main treatment plan. The governor, Tate Reeves, declared a state of emergency. Tonight, a race to distribute water in Jackson, Mississippi. Cars lined up for miles outside distribution centers full of locals hoping for water who left empty-handed after the supply quickly ran out. The water that they are giving, well, you can't get to it because the line be so damn long. For weeks, Jackson residents have been under a boil water notice put in place last month because of contaminated water concerns. Now they're on the brink of having no water at all. The uh, water pressure has been low. So Taprice Young water. has been spending $100 a week on water for her family. We've had to boil water to cook, to wash dishes, you know, pretty much to brush our teeth. State officials say flood water complications impacted storage tanks, pumps, and water flow, resulting in a failure at Jackson's main plant. The lack of water was due to pressure, a lack of pressure in the system. The water is not safe to drink, and I would even say it's not safe to brush your teeth with. Today, the governor declaring a new state of emergency, announcing a total or near total loss of water pressure throughout the city and surrounding areas. The city cannot produce enough water to fight fires, to reliably flush toilets, and to meet other critical needs. The state now preparing for the colossal challenge of distributing water to 180,000 people in and around Jackson. How long can the city operate without running water, distributing water the way you're planning to do? I mean, this isn't sustainable. We're going to go with this emergency plan as long as we have to. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that the situation around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant or the ZNPP remains highly threatening. After meeting with the International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Grossi, Zelensky again said that immediate and complete demilitarization of the ZNPP is necessary. This is just a drill. But the fear of nuclear disaster is very real. UN inspectors were on their way to the largest nuclear power plant in Europe on Tuesday, following shelling over the weekend, which both Ukraine and Russia blame on the other side. The Zaporizhia power plant was captured by Russian troops in March, but is still operated by Ukrainian staff. This is probably one of the top priority questions regarding the safety of Ukraine and the world today. Because of the occupation of our Zaporizhia nuclear power plant by Russian soldiers and the high risk of a potential explosion. The war's shifting front line now means it's in an active war zone. Satellite images show damage to the roof of the plant. Ukraine's nuclear agency has warned of the risk of a leak, which experts say would be on a far greater scale than that of the Fukushima plant in 2011. European leaders have repeatedly urged Russia not to use nuclear plants as a pawn of war. Nuclear safety and security cannot be undermined by this war. The IAEA's mission is important. It must protect this plant and the safety and security of the whole region. Ukrainian sovereignty over this plant must not be challenged. Nuclear power should not be an object of war. 
ukrainienne sur cette centrale. In Zaporizhia on Monday, residents were given iodine tablets to take in the event of radiation exposure. Russian energy giant Gazprom stated that it will completely suspend gas supplies to French industrial energy groups Engie this week due to the contract dispute amid concerns of a potential energy crisis in Europe this winter. As the gas trickles in from Russia, Europe is bracing for further cuts. It comes as Russian oil producer Gazprom announced on Tuesday it would suspend ties with French utility Engie starting on Thursday. In a statement, Gazprom said Engie had failed to pay in full for gas deliveries in July. Gazprom Export notified Engie of the complete suspension of gas supplies starting from September the 1st, 2022, until the moment it receives full payments for the gas it has supplied. Europe is already on high alert after Gazprom announced it would shut the Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline to Germany for three days at the end of August. But while that's supposed to only be for pipe maintenance, fears are growing that Moscow could delay the restart. Russia has already cut the pipeline supply to just 20% of capacity since the start of the country's invasion of its neighbor, Ukraine. In response, France has warned another drastic cut could severely jeopardize its annual economic growth forecast of 2.5% GDP. Russia is using gas as a weapon of war, and we must prepare for the worst-case scenario of a complete interruption of supplies. NG declined to say how much this would impact its volume of Russian gas imports, which have already fallen by 76% since the war began. All the while, France, like the rest of Europe, scrambles to find alternative power supply as gas prices soar. It is the end of abundance of petrol, not just for Europe or France, but the international petrol market. The country's problems could worsen still, as outages threaten the nuclear sector, which makes up 70% of power production. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev, who ended the Cold War without bloodshed but failed to prevent the collapse of the Soviet Union, dies at the age of 91. Gorbachev, the last Soviet president, forged arms reduction deals with the United States and partnerships with Western powers to remove the Iron Curtain that had divided Europe since World War II and bring about the reunification of Germany. <laughs> Mikhail Gorbachev, who was lauded in the West as the man who helped bring down the Berlin Wall and end the Cold War without bloodshed, but was widely despised at home, has died, Russian news agencies reported. He was 91. After decades of Cold War tension and confrontation, Gorbachev, the last Soviet president with a distinctive port wine birthmark on his head, broke with the past. He helped to remove the Iron Curtain that had divided Europe and bring about the reunification of Germany. He struck nuclear arms deals with the United States and brought the Soviet Union closer to the West than at any point since World War II. Gorbachev struck up a rapport with the West and with Ronald Reagan, the hawkish U.S. president who had called the Soviet Union the evil empire. Together they negotiated a landmark deal in 1987 to scrap intermediate-range nuclear missiles. Gorbachev, though, was not able to prevent the Soviet Union's collapse. When pro-democracy protests swept across the Soviet bloc nations of communist Eastern Europe in 1989, he refrained from using force. Unlike previous leaders who had sent tanks to crush uprisings in Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. But those protests fueled aspirations for autonomy in the 15 republics of the Soviet Union, which disintegrated over the next two years in chaotic fashion. Gorbachev became general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party in 1985 at age 54. He was a reformer, setting out to revitalize the system by introducing limited political and economic freedoms. His policy of glasnost, or free speech, allowed previously unthinkable criticism of the party and the state, but also emboldened nationalists who began to press for independence in the Baltic republics of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and elsewhere. 
While he was celebrated in the West, many Russians never forgave Gorbachev for the turbulence that his reforms unleashed, believing it was too high a price to pay for democracy. And in the final months of his life, Gorbachev has seen much of his legacy destroyed as President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has brought sanctions on Moscow and talks in both Russia and the West of a new Cold War. As one Kremlin watcher told, it's one of the ultimate tragedies that none of the values that Gorbachev ultimately came to embrace have been preserved by the leaders of Russia today. Armed forces continue to clash with protesters who are now armed with weapons as political tensions rise in Baghdad's green zone. This is the worst violence seen in Iraq's capital city in years. Overnight, deadly violence in Baghdad. A culmination of the long-running power struggle between rival Shiite groups and political tension as Iraq's leaders remain deadlocked on forming a government. Powerful cleric Muqtada al sadere is using the country's capital as his front line. Armed supporters taking to the streets, firing rifles and rocket launchers. After al sadere threatened to resign from politics, protesters loyal to al sadere breaching the government palace gates, toppling cement barriers, gunfire rippling through the streets. That led to the deaths of at least 30 people, according to the Associated Press. But tonight... The Iraqi Shiite leader calling for an end to the unrest. ولذلك خلال 60 دقيقة إذا لم ينسحب حتى من الاعتصام أمام البرلمان فأنا أبرع حتى من التيار. The violence and eventual retreat proving Al Sadr's influence. طاع على أمر السيد مختار الصدر انسحبنا. And the reality that danger could soon strike again. In Iraqi Arabic, it's Allah لا يرجع هالأيام, which means may God never bring back those days. Al Sadr emerged as a symbol of resistance against the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, using nationalist rhetoric steeped in religion to win over some of Iraq's most impoverished and unemployed populations. And a new election could still take place to determine which party will take control of the embattled region. But for now, peace in the green zone. At least now some Iraqis can breathe, because last night was very frightening for many people. Elon Musk's legal team filed another notice to terminate his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter, citing additional reasons. Twitter shares were also down more than 1% in pre-market trade. We're talking about Twitter. <laughs> With the trial looming, <laughs> Elon Musk is redoubling his efforts to end his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter sending a new letter of deal termination to the social media firm, citing a recent whistleblower complaint from the former security head at the company. Last week, Peter Zatko, a famed hacker known as Mudge, who was fired by Twitter in January, said in his complaint that Twitter prioritized user growth over reducing spam and that the company falsely claimed it had a solid security plan. In the latest letter to Twitter, Musk and his legal team said that if the allegations are true, then Twitter has breached some of the provisions of the deal to buy the company. Musk has also subpoenaed Zatko, seeking information mostly about the way Twitter measures spam accounts. But Twitter shot back, saying in a regulatory filing that Musk's fresh termination notice was invalid and wrongful under the terms of the deal. The world's richest person decided to spike the deal to buy Twitter in July, saying the company misled him and regulators about the true number of spam or bot accounts on the website. But Twitter says Musk can't just walk away. The two sides are scheduled to battle it out in court in a five-day trial in Delaware set for October 17th. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. 
water from swollen rivers in northern and southern parts of India has entered residents and has led to a drinking water shortage along with difficulties related to commuting and acquiring food. The first ship carrying food aid from Ukraine to droughted Horn of Africa since Russia's invasion of Ukraine has docked in Djibouti. German inflation rose to its highest level in almost 50 years in August, driven mainly by energy pricing rises, beating a previous high set only three months earlier. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we are leaving you tonight with North Koreans flocking to a water park in Pyongyang to escape the summer heat. Stay safe and have a good night.